reading today from Shambhala, The Sacred Path of the Warrior by Chagyam Trungpa. And we're reading chapter one, Creating an Enlightened Society. So, the Shambhala teachings are founded on the premise that there is a basic human wisdom that can help to solve the world's problems. The wisdom does not belong to any one culture or religion, nor does it come only from the West or the East. Rather, it is a tradition of human warriorship that has existed in many cultures at many times throughout history. In Tibet, as well as many other Asian countries, there are stories about a legendary kingdom that was a source of learning and culture for present-day Asian societies. According to the legends, this was a place of peace and prosperity, governed by wise and compassionate rulers. The citizens were equally kind and learned, so that in general the kingdom was a model society. This place was called Shambhala. It is said that Buddhism played an important role in the development of the Shambhala society. The legend tells us that Shakyamani Buddha gave advanced tatric tantric teachings to the first king of Shambhala, Dawa Sangpo. These teachings, which are preserved in the Kalakra Tantra, are considered to be among the most profound wisdom of Tibetan Buddhism. After the king had received this instruction, the story says that all of the people of Shambhala began to practice meditation and to follow the Buddhist path of loving, kindness, and concern for all beings. In this way, not just the rulers, but all of the subjects of the kingdom became highly developed people. Among the Tibetan people, there is a popular belief that the kingdom of Shambhala can still be found, hidden in the remote valley somewhere in the Himalayas. There are as well a number of Buddhist texts that give detailed but obscure directions for reaching Shambhala, but there are mixed opinions as to whether this should be taken literally or metaphorically. There are also many texts that give us elaborate descriptions of the kingdom. For example, according to the great commentary on the Kalakdra by the renowned 19th century Buddhist teacher Mithem, the land of Shambhala is north of the river Sita, and the country is divided by eight mountain ranges. The palace of the Rig Rigdens, or the imperial rulers of Shambhala, is built on top of a circular mountain in the center of the country. This mountain, Mithem tells us, is named Kailasa, the palace, which is called the Palace of Kalapa, compri comprises many square miles in front of it. To the south is a beautiful park known as Malaya, and in the middle of the park is a temple devoted to Kalakdra that was built by Dawa Songpo. Other legends say the kingdom of Shambhala disappeared from the earth many centuries ago, at a certain point, the entire society had become enlightened and the kingdom vanished into another more celestial realm. According to these stories, the Rigin kings of Shambhala continue to watch over human affairs and will one day return to earth to save humanity from destruction. Many Tibetans believe that the great Tibetan warrior king, Gesar of Ling, was inspired and guided by the Rigins and the Shambhala wisdom. This reflects the belief in the celestial existence of the kingdom. Gesar is thought to have traveled to Shambhala, so his link to the kingdom was a spiritual one. He lived in approximately the 11th century and ruled the provincial kingdom of Ling, which is located in the province of Kham, East Tibet. Following Gesar's reign, stories about his accomplishment as a warrior and ruler sprang up throughout Tibet, eventually becoming the greatest epic of Tibetan literature. Some legends say that Gesar will reappear from Shambhala, leading an army to conquer the forces of darkness in the world. In the recent years, some Western scholars have suggested that the kingdom of Shambhala may actually have been one of the historically documented kingdoms of early times, such as Zhangzong, Kingdom of Central Asia. Many scholars, however, believe that the stories of Shambhala are completely mythical. While it is easy enough to dismiss the kingdom of Shambhala, as pure fiction, it is also possible to see in this legend the expression of deeply rooted and very real human desires for a good 
and fulfilling life. In fact, among many Tibetan Buddhist teachers, there has long been a tradition that regards the kingdom of Shambhala not as an external place, but as a ground or root of wakefulness and sanity that exists as potential within every human being. From that point of view, it is not important to determine whether the kingdom of Shambhala is fact or fiction. Instead, we should appreciate and emulate the ideal of an enlightened society that it represents. Over the past seven years, I have been presenting a series of Shambhala teachings that use the image, the image of Shambhala kingdom to represent the ideal of secular enlightenment. That is, the possibility of uplifting your personal existence and that of others without the help of any religious outlook. For although the Shambhala tradition is founded on the sanity of gentleness of the Buddhist tradition, at the same time, it has its own independent basis, which is directly cultivating who and what we are as human beings. With the great problems now facing human society, it seems increasingly important to find simple, and non-sectarian ways to work with ourselves and to share our understanding with others. The Shambhala teachings or Shambhala vision, as this approach is more broadly called, is one such attempt to encourage a wholesome existence for ourselves and others. The current state of world affairs is a source of concern to all of us. The threat of nuclear war, widespread poverty and economic instability, social and political chaos, and psychological upheavals of many kinds. The world is in absolute turmoil. The Shambhala teachings are founded on the premise that there is basic human wisdom that can help to solve the world's problems. This wisdom does not belong to any one culture or religion, nor does it come only from the West or the East. Rather, it is a tradition of human warriorship that has existed in many cultures at many times throughout history. Warriorship here does not refer to making war on others. Aggression is the source of our problems, not the solution. Here the word warrior is taken from the Tibetan pawu, which literally means one who is brave. Warriorship in the context is the tradition of human bravery or the tradition of fearlessness. The North American Indians had such a tradition and also existed in South American Indian societies. The Japanese ideal of the samurai also represents a warrior tradition of wisdom, and there has been principles of enlightened warriorship in Western Christian societies as well. King Arthur is a legendary example of warriorship in the Western tradition, and the great rulers in the Bible, such as King David, are examples of warriors common to both the Jewish and the Christian traditions. On our planet Earth, there have been many fine examples of warriorship. The key to warriorship and the first principle of Shambhala vision is not being afraid of who you are. Ultimately, that is the definition of bravery, not being afraid of yourself. Shambhala vision teaches that in the face of the world's great problems, we can be heroic and kind at the same time. Shambhala vision is the opposite of selfishness. When we are afraid of ourselves and afraid of seeming threat the world presents, then we become extremely selfish. We want to build our own little nests, our own cocoons, so that we can live by ourselves in a secure way. But we can be much more brave than that. We must try to think beyond our homes, beyond the fire burning in the fireplace, and beyond sending our children to school or getting to work in the morning. We must try to think how we can help this world. If we don't help, nobody will. It is our turn to help the world. At the same time, helping others does not mean abandoning our individual lives. You don't have to rush out to become the mayor of your city or the president of the United States in order to help others. But you can begin You can begin with your relatives and your friends and the people around you. In fact, you can start with yourself. The important point is to realize that you are never off duty. You can never just relax because the whole world needs help. While everyone has a responsibility to help the world, we can create additional chaos if we try to impose our ideas or our help on others. Many people have theories about what the world needs. Some people think the world needs communism. Some people think the world needs democracy. Some people think that technology will save the world. And some people think that technology will destroy the world. The Shambhala teachings are not based on converting the world to another theory. 
The premise of Shambhala vision is that in order to establish an enlightened society for others, we need to discover what inherently we have to offer the world. So to begin with, we should make an effort to examine our own experience in order to see what it contains that is of value in helping ourselves and others to uplift their existence. If we are willing to take on an unbiased look, we will find that in spite of all of our problems and confusion, all our emotional and psychological ups and downs, there is something basically good about our existence as human beings. Unless we can discover that ground of goodness in our own lives, we cannot hope to improve the lives of others. If we are simply miserable and wretched beings, how can we possibly imagine, let alone realize, an enlightened society? Discovering real goodness comes from appreciating very simple experiences. We're not talking about how good it feels to make a million dollars or finally graduate from college or buy a new house, but we are speaking here of the basic goodness of being alive, which does not depend on our accomplishments or fulfilling our desires. We experience glimpses of goodness all the time, but we often fail to acknowledge them. When we see a bright color, we are witnessing our own inherent goodness. When we hear a beautiful sound, we are hearing our own basic goodness. When we step out of the shower, we feel fresh and clean, and when we walk out of a stuffy room, we appreciate the sudden whiff of fresh air. These events take just a fraction of a second, but they are real experiences of goodness. They happen to us all of the time, but usually we ignore them as mundane or purely coincidental. According to the Shambhala principles, however, it is worthwhile to recognize and take advantage of those moments because they are revealing basic non-aggression and freshness in our lives. Basic goodness. Every human being has a basic nature of goodness, which is undiluted and unconfused. That goodness contains tremendous gentleness and appreciation. As human beings, we can make love. We can stroke someone with a gentle touch. We can kiss someone with gentle understanding. We can appreciate beauty. We can appreciate the best of this world. We can appreciate its vividness, the yellowness of the yellow, the redness of the red, the greenness of the green, the purpleness of the purple. Our experience is real. When yellow is yellow, can we say it is red? If we don't like the yellowness of it, that would be contradicting reality. When we have sunshine, can we reject it and say that the sunshine is terrible? Can we really say that? When we have brilliant sunshine or wonderful snowfall, we appreciate it, and when we appreciate reality, it can actually work on us. We may have to get up in the morning after only a few hours of sleep, but if we look out the window and see the sun shining, it can cheer us up. We can actually cure ourselves of depression if we recognize that the world we have is good. It is not just an arbitrary idea that the world is good, but it is good because we can experience its goodness. We can experience our world as healthy and straightforward, direct and real, because our basic nature is to go along with goodness or situations. The human potential for intelligence and dignity is attuned to experiencing the brilliance of the bright blue sky, the freshness of the green fields, and the beauty of the trees and mountains. We have an actual connection to reality that can wake us up and make us feel basically, fundamentally good. Shambhala vision is tuning in to our ability to wake ourselves up and recognize that goodness can happen to us. In fact, it is happening already. But then, there is still a question. You might have made a genuine connection to your world, catching a glimpse of sunshine, seeing bright colors, hearing good music, eating good food, or whatever it may be. But how does a glimpse of goodness relate with ongoing experience? On the one hand, you might feel... I want to get that goodness that is in me and in the phenomenal world. So you rush, rush around trying to find a way to possess it. Or an even cruder level, you might say, How much does it cost to get that? That experience was so beautiful, I want to own it. The basic problem with that approach is that you never feel satisfied, even if you get what you want, because you still want so badly. If you take a walk on Fifth Avenue, you see that kind of desperation. You might say that the people shopping on Fifth Avenue have good taste, and that therefore they have possibilities of realizing human dignity. But on the other hand, it is though they were covered with thorns. They want to grasp more and more and more. 
Then there is the approach of surrendering or humbling yourself to get in touch with goodness. Someone tells you that he can make you happy if you will just give your life to his cause. If you believe that he has goodness that you want, you may be willing to shave your hair or wear robes or crawl on the floor or eat with your hands to get in touch with goodness. You are willing to trade in your dignity and become a slave. Both of those situations are attempt to, attempts to retrieve something good, something real. If you are rich, you are willing to spend thousands of dollars on it. If you are poor, you are willing to commit your life to it. But there is something wrong with both of those approaches. The problem is that when we begin to realize the potential goodness in ourselves, we often take our discovery much too seriously. We might kill for goodness or die for goodness. We want it so badly. What is lacking is a sense of humor. <laughs> humor here does not mean telling jokes or being comical or criticizing others and laughing at them. A genuine sense of humor is having a light touch, not beating reality into the ground by appreciating reality with a light touch. The basis of Shambhala vision is rediscovering that perfect and real sense of humor, the light touch of appreciation. If you look at yourself, if you look at your mind, if you look at your activities, you can repossess the humor that you have lost in the course of your life. To begin with, you have to look at your ordinary domestic reality, your knives, your forks, your plates, your telephone, your dishwasher, and your towels, ordinary things. There's nothing mystical or extraordinary about them, but if there is no connection with ordinary everyday situations, if you don't examine your mundane life, then you will never find any humor or dignity or ultimately any reality. The way you comb your hair, the way you dress, the way you wash your dishes, all of those activities are an extension of sanity. They are a way of connecting with reality. A fork is a fork, of course. It is a simple implement of eating, but at the same time, the extension of your, your sanity and your dignity may depend on how you use your fork. Very simply, Shambhala Vision is trying to provoke you to understand how you live, your relationship with ordinary life. As human beings, we are basically awake and we can understand reality. We are not enslaved by our lives. We are free. Being free in this case means simply that we have a body and a mind and we can uplift ourselves in order to work with the reality in a dignified and humorous way. If we begin to perk up, we will find the whole universe, including the seasons, the snowfall, the ice, and the mud, is also powerfully working on us. Life is a humorous situation, but it is not mocking us. We find that, after all, we can handle our world. We can handle our universe properly and fully in an uplifted fashion. The discovery of basic goodness is not a religious experience particularly. Rather, it is the realization that we can directly experience and work with reality, the real world that we are in. Experiencing the basic goodness of our lives makes us feel that we are intelligent and decent people and the world is not a threat. When we feel that our lives are genuine and good, we do not have to deceive ourselves or other people. We can see our shortcomings without feeling guilty or inadequate, and at the same time, we can see our potential for extending goodness to others. We can tell the truth straightforwardly and be absolutely open but steadfast at the same time. The essence of warriorship or the essence of human bravery is refusing to give up on anyone or anything. We can never say that we are simply falling to pieces or that anyone else is, and we can never say that about the world either. Within our lifetime, there will be great problems in the world, but let us make sure that within our lifetime, no disasters happen. We can prevent them. It is up to us. We can save the world from destruction to begin with. That is why Shambhala Vision exists. It is a centuries-old idea that by serving the world, we can save it. But saving the world is not enough. We have to work to build an enlightened human society as well. In this book, we are going to discuss the ground of enlightened society and the path towards it. Rather than presenting some utopian fantasy of what an enlightened society might be. If we want to help the world, we have to make a personal journey. We can't simply theorize or speculate about our destination. So it is up to each of us individually to find the meaning of enlightened society and how it can be realized. It is my hope that this presentation of the path of a Shambhala warrior may contribute to the dawning of this discovery. The end.
of chapter one.